Good morning. Good morning. I got you all asymmetrical here. There we go. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I am, I'm squared. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. Almost. I'm Deanna. Happy Monday. How are you getting in my chair lately? It's bothering me more and more when this thing is not squared, but I'm just going to have to let it go. Happy Monday. How are you? I have had such a busy weekend. I cannot wait to hear what everybody was up to as well. Carol, good morning. Great to see you. Sunny and windy day in central Wisconsin. Welcome back. I still need to write to you about that proddy. Kirsten, a good day to everybody. Cloudy and radiant Vermont this morning. Womp womp. It's a little bit gray here too. It's definitely gray, but it is so pretty. I don't want to rub it in for people who are not living in parts of the world where there is a great change at this time of year. But just driving in through this sort of tunnel of trees has been amazing. It has been a bit um, patchy and a bit ratty this year, a little bit here in Connecticut. There's a lot of red out, but there's a lot on the ground too. And I don't mind that either because isn't it nice when you go walking down the sidewalk and you're crunching on the leaves that are down? I just, I love that as much as anything, I think. Lisa, good morning from Pennsylvania. The sun is shining. Doreen, good morning. Rain falling here in New York, but you you love the rain, I know. It gives you a reason to stay in and work on your projects. Kiara, happy coffee time. Great pick-me-up for Monday. Congrats on Connor's archery first place. Is about as good as it gets. Congrats, congrats to him. What a sweetheart. Webnut, good morning from Colorado. Great to see you. Happy Monday. Beverly, happy Monday. You were busy today doing those plaster moldings or something, right? I just glanced at it quickly, but I thought... You never stop. You are like a house on fire. I hate that expression though. Isn't that awful? It's like it's like a weird, a weird kind of curse. You are like a busy firefly. I'm gonna say that instead. In the midst of good old uh, Pacific Northwest wind rainstorm. You know, you reminded me, I think we're supposed to be getting some pretty crazy nor'easter type weather out here. I forgot to check the weather, but it's probably a good thing to do. The pumpkin sues. Good chilly morning from Kansas, and you've got that pumpkin on. Perfect. Penny, good to see you in Myrtle Beach. And Joy, good to see you. Rainy in Bradenton, Florida. Crystal, good to see you. Crystal, did you notice the other day when I was asking for your Krillos that I did a fusion of your name and the word pillow? I was being, I was being stupid as usual, um, but I need a Krillo. I haven't forgotten. I just, it's been flat out flat out for so long. Tara, good to see you. Happy Monday. I love these little emoji icon things with leaves falling and sugar maples and pumpkin faces. Dave, good afternoon. Dark and dark and rainy. Oh, it's like a dress rehearsal for Halloween. It absolutely is. You just reminded me of dark and stormy. Is dark and stormy a drink that everybody knows? Because I keep seeing it on the menu lately and I didn't know it until recently. It's very good. Very good cocktail, but I wondered if that was a universal, um, if I'm just late to the party with that. Malia, hello, good morning, good to see you. Debbie, good to see you in upstate New York, good morning. Anita, good morning, welcome back. You're in the midst of rain and cold, 9%, uh, 9 degrees Celsius in London, Ontario. Ooh, we're going to start getting a crazy mixed bag. Donna, good morning in Alberta. Chrissy, good morning. Good to see you. I saw your pictures of that little one doing the monster mash. So, so, so revved up and cute. Catherine, good to see you. You woke up in time. You're a night owl. Oh, I don't blame you. You know, it's so nice when you are able to, when you have the kind of work or the kind of schedule where you can work according to your own body clock, isn't it? Because we're all so different. And I always think I'm, I'm much more of a wake up super early and I prefer to go to bed early if I can. I've never been much of a night owl, even when I worked in the theater and I had to be. It was still really a push, push against my nature. But I always think when I think about the different schedules that people keep, how Henry David Thoreau, right, the famous American writer and uh, transcendentalist, um, experimenter, social reformer, all of those great things, teacher, um, he always used to say, you know, because he, he had that great experiment of living on Walden Pond and building his cabin there and taking some time away from the sort of hustle and bustle. And to be fair, he had just accidentally burnt down his family's pencil factory uh, in an accident. And his brother, I think at that point, already had lockjaw and was on his way out. And he had developed psycho, um, psychosomatic symptoms of lockjaw and almost died himself because he couldn't 
open his mouth to eat lots of bad things at one time so he he took to the woods and he had that great passage in his book where he talks about when he's tired he sleeps even if it's the middle of the day and when when he's not tired and he's alert and alive and awake he wakes up and starts wandering and recording the movements of animals and things around him in nature and um, and weirdly, he still during that time was walking like multiple times a week to Boston for lectures and very much part of society. So not living completely away from nature, but pushing the idea of doing what our body clock wants to do. Because like I was saying in class on Cape Cod this weekend, when you start hooking or punching and you're holding that hook or that punch a certain way, even if somebody was holding it um, in the left this week, even though it wasn't a dominant hand, I always say you should, if that's your instinct, instead of doing what the nuns did in Catholic school and sort of beating the left-handedness or the um, less dominant hand out of someone, instead of doing that, I always think it's best to go the route of working with what you instinctively do, isn't it? Because whether it's sleeping or holding a hook, when you work against your own body, you are bound to have trouble, right? You are just bound to have trouble. If there's any chance of working with your body, uh, the chance of being successful is like a million times higher, isn't it? We don't all have that chance, though. Life has so many kinds of crazy d demands and constraints on us that uh, we can't always live like thorough, can we? And of course, there's other classic expression that your life should be so simple that you should be able to keep all of your accounts on your thumbnail. Can you imagine? I mean, I can't imagine. It's been a long time since I think anybody can keep all of their business on their thumbnail, but it is an ideal, isn't it? So, oh, Joy, oh, your sister Courtney's watching today too. I sent, tell Courtney, or Courtney, I sent your um, Monster Mash swatch set with the mystery pattern out yesterday. Uh, well, in the mail, so it's gone. So that'll be nice. Amber, good to see you. Crisp fall day in Alberta, northern Alberta. How nice. Linda, good morning. Good to see you. Matthew. Thank you, like you like this combo. <laughs> Thank you. I put on my super bright lipstick today. I don't know why. I figured I was offsetting the hair in a ponytail pig pig look. Thank you so much. Yeah, these. You know, I keep finding the best glasses. I, you know, I love the peepers, and I usually get them there. But I found these at one of these country stores in Stowe, New Hampshire, and I forget what brand they are. But they were super inexpensive. And when I looked through them for people who wear glasses, it was one of those moments of I can see everything. I can't believe it. You know, it just you didn't realize how out of focus things were, how sort of static things were, and then they all got real clear. Um, but more and more, I've been seeing reading glasses in different places, and it's so good to take a few pairs and try them on because even if you think your vision is great or that you know your uh, prescription, um, sometimes you put one on that's not exactly the one that you've been using and it won't work for everything, will it? Well, you know, I have ones for here, for here, and then for over there. But once in a while you put some on and it's like, wow, for $7, like I can see everything. It's nice. Thank you. I love it. I love it when I have these finds. Helene, great to see you. Great to see you. Welcome to Monday morning. Never heard it. So it does, it, Dave, the dark and stormy, somebody else will know, but it was like one of these very masculine drinks with like rum and dark everything in it. And it looked like, um, you know, um, eye of witch and whisker of wart, you know, like when it arrived at the table. Uh, very, very cool, am dark amber looking thing, really atmospheric. Not good for summer, I don't think. Carrie, good to see you. Amen on body clock. Isn't that right? I wish everybody could just go with what works for them. Um, because it, it also affects your happiness, doesn't it? When you work out of your own schedule, like what's instinctive? It's like, I mean, work itself is tough, right? Not everybody wants to work. Um, not everybody has a job that they want to go to, but just working outside of your own schedule is just a bad start, isn't it? I think slowly that's changing, but not quick enough. Donna, good to see you. You made it in Tennessee. I'm so glad. You're in Knoxville, right? You are. I think you're in Knoxville. Wow, amazing. I've often created a bed under my desk like George Costanza from Seinfeld. I totally forgot he did that. That was so funny. So funny. That was a great episode. Oh, that was funny. And then he was trying to, well, no, I won't go there. There was a like dirty part of the episode when he was trying to eat in bed too and combine some other time time saving problems. Oh, Courtney, you logged on. That's great. Hello and good morning. It's so good to see everybody. It has been a good morning this morning. It's been remarkably good in most ways. The way that I dropped the ball was I forgot my coffee time book, but it's okay. 
I, I did a save when I got here. But remember today I was going to do that hooking on the hill book. I think this is one of those happy accident things because I had it ready to go and I have been enjoying it. It's been my bedside reading and I've been trying to put together some interesting parts to share for episodes. I was going to do it for over two or three episodes. Such a dense book. So happy, uh, so beautiful and so much inspiration in one book. So, you know, I'm thinking because of this happy accident of having forgotten the book on the bedside table, I think I'm going to run that episode as our Friday night cocktail night episode this coming Friday, because you know how I am such a sucker for having a cozy episode on a Friday night. I think that would be the perfect one because it will be on the longer side, more like an hour to an hour and a half, I think, which is normally our sweet spot for a Friday night cocktail night. So I think I'll do that, but I did manage to save... Um, because I had this book as a standby that I keep looking at and seeing available online. I'm going to come to that in just a minute. And I thought, why not look at this today? Because if I'm seeing it in all the buy and sell groups on Facebook, if you are on Facebook, then you probably are too. And I was wondering, um, you know, what's in this book? It's so different. It's a 2006 book and it's been, it was put out in conjunction, uh, rug hooking magazine with quilt, the quilt, the quilt magazine. Um, those two in conjunction with each other published this book. So it's been out for a while, and it is a strange kind of a hybrid, just looking at the cover. But Diana sent, and if you're watching, thank you so much, sent it to me. So I had it, and I thought, let me look at this and share this with you. If you're sitting on the fence about purchasing this book, um, then you'll know what's inside of it at least. It'll be a nice way to start. And don't forget, Rug Hooking Magazine is giving our group 15% off all books, including their latest publication, which is Hooking Landscapes. And you need to use the code RCH for Ribbon Candy Hooking 1515. RCH15. So make sure that if you're buying books that you get a, get a discount because why not, right? Particularly the new ones. Yes, please remember thumbs up. Thank you so much. What a great weekend it was. Um, I wonder if any of you sitting out there are people who I was with this weekend when I was at Cape Cod teaching at Salt Yarn. I love teaching there. It's always a sold out class. It's always filled. The atmosphere is always great. Uh, high energy. It's such a mix on Cape Cod. And I know not everybody who, who goes there to see me and to do classes there because I do a different one every time I'm there. Um, you know, people are coming from distances, but in general, I'm noticing at those classes that I'm getting a whole spectrum of people, all different kinds of people from very young to much older people. And I'm thinking, this is fantastic, isn't it? All of these different kinds of people in one classroom who are here to learn and start a new hobby. I think that is amazing. It's always so po I love teaching everywhere I teach, but there's always such a range of people there and I, I haven't gotten repeats yet. I, this is the third class I've done that's been sold out there and there's been no repeats. It was such a good class. Some people hooked the primitive tom I did that was more of a Native American wild turkey than a Macy's Day Parade turkey. And other people hooked the owl, the moonlight becomes you. And we did yarn for both kits because it's a yarn store. And I was also trying to promote the yarn that she makes and sells at her store. And her mother was in the class, which was so nice. B, she was such a beautiful woman, gorgeous woman. Um, but what a fun class. And everybody was so positive and excited. My friend Claire was there who tuned in and she asked me, how are the kids doing? And how, are, how was your Cape Cotter? Because on Friday night for our bingo night episode, if you were watching, it was our most chaotic episode ever. The kids were wild and feral, like little feral animals. Joss was helping me with the spinning of the wheel. Uh, she was doing Chipotle, which is shaking her butt into the camera over my shoulder, doing lots of that. She, I noticed a few times that she scratched, scratched her butt like right over my shoulder for all of you on camera. Uh, I didn't catch a lot of it until I watched the replay, but they were wild. And Teddy was extra wild, trying to help out a bit, right? Um, it's always, you know, help in parentheses, but he was wild too because today is the first day, the first day of his school life that he is attending a school that he number one wants to go to, number two they want him at, number three he has his own desk and it's not moving, and number four we expect to be there for more than one school year. We probably will know over the summer that he's going back there because the class is permanent there. So say a little prayer for Teddy, he's there his first official day there he for the first time this year he wore one of his special t-shirts like one of his video game t-shirts zardy's maze it's like a scarecrow horror character but it was the first time this year that he's wanted to wear something other than a gray hanes shirt um, so that tells me that he's trying to express himself and i love that it is so positive 
So it was good. I got both I got both kids off to school, done, got in the car, got to work, thought, I'm doing great. And then I thought, my coffee table book is on the bedside table. Who cares, right? We're going to make it work. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm so happy for I'm, I'm just so, it's such a huge weight off my shoulders. And I want to say thank you to everybody who's sending me images and emails about helping me out with my book project. I got some beautiful images of hook drugs this weekend, applique rugs. I'm always looking for more. Go ahead and send more or shoot me an email, ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com. Or you can find me in our Facebook group, which is Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club. Um, I will probably like next year, once this, this book should come out in August, um, I will be launching a second site that's a sister site that's more for many kinds of rug making, not, not woven, but just about every other kind of rug making with every other kind of tool in your hand that'll be a sister group to our Facebook group. So it'll be a bit more, a bit less focused, a bit, a bit less punch and hook driven, but I already have it reserved and ready to launch. So I'll be doing that. I'll let you know when I do that in case you're interested in many kinds of rug making and, and lots of kinds of crafting. Thank you so much. Hope he gets to show off all his, his video stuff and his knowledge. He is so knowledgeable. He is like a little font of information. It's so hard to always be present and listen, but it's so important to always be present and listen and make eye contact and stay connected. But it's hard because I'm not interested in video games at all. And it's a lot. And you would think I would be coming knowledgeable, but I have to put it into my short-term memory because... Um, if I filled up my brain with the things he tells me, we wouldn't have any episodes. I would just be lost in space all the time. So I hope you had a great weekend too. Um, I always love hearing what you've been up to as well. It is such a great time of year right now, this fall time. And, um, I didn't stay over on the Cape. I hoped that I would and go searching for rugs and things. And I always like to show you things I find, but we didn't have time. I went with, I went with Jay and he looked for some stuff for the antiques auctions that he runs and uh, he, de he got to do some shopping, but um, I was in class that whole day and it was worth it because it was a wonderful class. And the Plymouth class that's coming up is sold out, but I will let you know when I have other dates coming up. There'll be other dates coming up, um, particularly as soon as it's New Year's. So you'll see me appearing more at like Atha uh, meetings, doing talks, and I got a um, sort of proposition for a dyeing class in Massachusetts um, sometime in the early spring. So you can always write about those things. I'm just booking out to January at this point, but I would love to see you in another place, in your place. I would love to see you. So let's take a look at this book. It is such a different book. We'll do a little book review today and see if we can get some ideas churning, right? So Projects for Fiber Art Lovers. And, you know, more and more my brain goes in this direction, not just because of the book project, but just because, you know, I love hooking, I love punching, but I, I still have that fondness for quilting. I mean, I'm not going to do it anytime soon. I just can't stand the act of sewing anymore um, for myself. But, you know, when I think about other kinds of textile art, there's so many, right? There are so many. And more and more, I find myself thinking about other projects, particularly when I make really beautiful wool, um, like this wool, right? I had to make another batch of wool last night. I did this is just a little bit of it, but I did about another, I don't know, God knows how many yards for the background of the Prati for the Pilgrim hat, right? Because it's very, very dark, but it has little pops of other colors in it, kind of a Thanksgiving, like a, like a spilled Thanksgiving meal. If you, you know, I've seen like some serious trouble on neckties, men's neckties after Thanksgiving dinner, kind of a fusion of cranberry sauce and squash and all of those things, kind of a bit like that, right? And I can say the same thing for like my lap, which is why I always tuck my napkin in like a big loser. Um, by the way, Pridey class is still open, but I need to send the kids out today, tomorrow, Wednesday, the latest, right, to feel comfortable about that. The Pridey Pilgrim Hat class, been working on that. I'm cutting up those backgrounds in a minute, and I've been working on some of the colors for the centers of the flowers, right? This is kind of color palette. So a little bit Thanksgiving, but I want to keep some brights in because of dark, light, dull, bright. So some of those, and then I've been working away like a nut on all these little packets. This one's not complete, but tons of packets of cut Prati flowers. And those are a little bit sombra. If when they're sombra, I add, you know, everyone is gonna have the, at least one larger scaled one too, even though it doesn't fit this project, just so you know. 
And incidentally, all this Prati stuff that I'm cutting out, remember the Sissix machine that most of us are aware of? And if you have one, you probably got it. We well, probably have the Sissix. You don't need to get that from the old tattered flag. But the old tattered flag sells those big uh, trays that you can run through with your strips. Well, they also make Prati trays. So I've got both Prati trays. And it makes it, if you are a Prati maniac, um, it makes it a lot easier. You know, it's hard to justify the cost, I think, if you are not, like, in business. But it is nice for me having these trays because they make such perfect shaped flowers for Prati. So be looking out for that on the Ribbon Candy Hooking site because that deadline is coming, although you can always watch it recorded, right, and you still get the same kit. So, you know, thinking about not just different textiles and crossover arts and crafts, right, that would hit, hit us all, I think, in our sweet spots, like things that we love, things that we love to see. The more that I dye, hand dye, stuff like the Prati background, the spilled, the spilled Thanksgiving meal, the more I have trouble with my favorite ones cutting them up. And then I start thinking about wool applique, of course. So this book is interesting because you know, with wool applique, you wouldn't be cutting it up. You'd just be cutting your shape and sewing it down to your background. This book is great because I think it reminds us of um, a lot of the other options that maybe we sometimes forget. Using the same materials, still using wool or t-shirt material or whatever it is that you like to use the most for the projects that we do, hooking and punching, so many of those materials cross over to other things as well. And that's what this book is really reminding us. Country coordinates to quilt hook, stitch, and paint. That's a bit of a stretch. So let's look at the projects in this book. It goes by, um, it feels like it goes by season, not officially, but it shows us a nice sort of cross-section of different projects that um, would be sort of um, indicative of the season. For example, Precious Pansies. Looks like a nice, this is a quilt pattern, but hold your breath. Uh, that's a nice springtime design, isn't it? So it's showing us things like this is a banner or like maybe we would sometimes say a yard long, like a long skinny piece, right, that would hang like kind of bell pole style, um, available as a quilt. But as you know, whenever you're looking at a quilt design, and if you are an ex-quilter and you're just coming to punching or hooking, you can really look at quilt designs as also rug hooking designs, right, or punch needle designs, because all you're talking about is lines, and those lines can easily transfer to a different class. You're talking about a pattern, and that pattern is not unique or exclusive to quilting or any craft. It's just a line drawing. So, for example, the pansies really double up as a, let me see if that's in focus, really double up as a um, wool applique piece. There we go. And, you know, sometimes wool applique pieces in this style are called penny rugs, it, this is kind of a morph of the term, right? Because penny rugs used to just be the circles, penny shaped that were stacked on top of each other. But more and more penny rugs with great um, companies, like my favorite one for patterns is All Through the Night. They do a lot with penny rugs. You know, you, you, you see the most beautiful, simple line drawings that, again, can be used. They do a lot with quilting, a lot with embroidery, a lot with wool applique. But the thing is, with more and more of these designs kind of available and in, in our faces, thankfully, you get this sort of mutation of the penny rug, which is the, the lamb's tongue border, right? All these little pieces make the lamb's tongue, and then kind of a half a penny in them. So this would still, if you were to find this like in a gallery or on eBay somewhere for sale, it would certainly be called a penny rug. It's being called a penny rug here. Right, so it's taken a little language shifting, right? It's taken a little bit of um, uh, time and evolution to uh, get to a point where we would call a wool applique rug a penny rug, but we're there and it's absolutely fitting. So things like that, and you know, it does show you in this book, if you are interested in combining crafts or just trying wool applique exclusively with your scraps, right, that were too small to cut into strips or to use for hooking or punching, with those scraps, you can still use those and save those to do either confetti dyeing, right? If you still want to do just rug hooking, confetti dyeing, roll, roll all of your little scrappies into a piece of wool, tie it with twine super tight and drop it into the boiling water with some white vinegar or citric acid, and it's going to transfer those, make a pattern onto your piece. 
But if you don't want to and you're thinking about doing something completely different, Monty Python style, then think about wool applique because you're able to use cut those little pieces into whatever shape and sew them down. And then they're showing you very simple, useful things like the different stitches, the buttonhole stitch, the classic that you would use if you were shifting to wool applique. Now this one is real cute because this is this is touching. This is this particular project is by Barbara Carroll, who is who is Wooly Fox, right? Am I dreaming that? She's Wooly. She's the Wooly Fox brand. Um, let me know if I'm wrong. Um, I, I'd like to be corrected <laughs> always when I'm wrong. But this is a beautiful piece, and they're showing this piece very Magdalena E. B. Briner style, which we are so familiar with on this show. They're showing this piece two different ways: as an applique quilt piece and as a hook drug. And this just is going to remind us how easy this crossover is between these two sort of sister crafts. So let's see. This is the project, right, as a hook drug. Real familiar with this kind of composition. You know, I always like what she does, Barbara Carroll. She always goes out and does something a little bit different. You know how Magdalena, we're so used to seeing in the empty space those kind of skeletal leaves that are picked out in a mosaic style with color? or stars. Well, here, Barbara has put in chicks, right? You don't see this in Magdalena, but in terms of a, she needed a scatter pattern, right? In the background, she needed a scatter pattern, and she just felt that instinctively. But instead of doing one of the kind of tropes that Magdalena would always do, she did something completely different that was a bit more farm country primitive using these chicks, and I think it is just an absolutely brilliant solution just reminds us um, how many options there are and sometimes we forget. So that was a great pattern. And then she shows the same characters again in a different kind of configuration as a penny rug with the lamb's tongues on the side and a couple of the actual traditional pennies right here and here and again with the chicks. I do too, Kirsten, they're so cute. And the, a very dark parrot palette, very similar to what Magdal Magdalena would have done. I'm getting really tongue twisted today for some reason. There they are. Boop, boop, boop. So cute. So, so far I'm seeing patterns in this book that are just, they're so different, right? They're so different from each other. And I think that's always helpful. And then we get into a kind of a quilt design, but as you can see, the design is mirrored in the hook drug on the floor. As far as color, in the quilt you've got these central um, uh, sort of medallions that have a floral in them, kind of like a Baltimore album uh, feel to them. And they've just taken the flower shape and scattered the flower shape across a rug design. And that works great too. What a great compliment. It doesn't have to be matchy-matchy, does it? It's, it's easy to do matchy-matchy and it's a bit instinctive, but it's also nice to just think about, actually it wasn't hooked, it was a painted floor cloth, but all the same same pattern, right? You could do it hooked easily. This also reminds me of the time that we've spent talking about Mackenzie Childs, right? Childs, uh, two different people, um, and their work. Very pattern driven, and it's always a fusion of patterns. It's always pattern besides pattern. So um, on the busy side, but controlled, right? Controlled busyness so it doesn't turn into chaos. Um, so that's a beautiful pattern too, and she's giving the authors of this book, and you know, it's not it's not an authorship kind of a thing, is it? It's like published by the quilt magazine, rug hooking magazine, but then each chapter is a different artist or maker who tells you all the ins and outs of their how to for that particular project, and again, the projects are translating very well to rug hooking, and again, here in this one, it looks like we have kind of a wool applique over the table that probably is really a wall hanging, but, but draped over the chair is a hook drug, a hook drug runner with a lamb's tongue edge on it, right? Or this could easily be a wall hanging too, but really beautiful. So let's look at how that shakes out. Red Bird Hooked Rug by Alice Strabel. I know we talked about her on, at Bingo Night this past Friday. And Sally Court, K-O-R-T-E. So another beautiful pattern, and in this case, the lamb's tongues are hooked. Rabbit hole. Catherine, the painted floor cloth is such a crazy rabbit hole. And you know, it's so, I have so many floor cloth books too. 
It's so easy to do because it's just like a heavyweight piece of canvas or duck, something like that material. And you're literally just um, painting it and turning the sides under. And you think, you know, how could a piece of painted canvas, which has probably become very glossy and slippery, how could that ever do for something that you would walk on on the floor? But incredibly, it does do. And I know in some of the episodes we've done on Coffee Time here, when we talk about, we've looked at like colonial houses, and even before hook drugs, we were seeing painted floors and floor cloths, and they do do, and they last remarkably well. And I actually have one down in my the little guest room at the house, not at the studio. And I've been walking over that for years. And if anything, it gets better. Minimal paint loss. Don't ask me how, but it it just lasts. I don't typically walk with my shoes in the house. Maybe that's helping. But, you know, it, it's a cool rabbit hole, the floor cloth, for sure. But this is a real nice runner. And, um, and then they move to this project, which let me show you the runner as it's drawn, black and white. And then check out this project, which is basically... The only change that they're making, they're still using the same squares and the same patterns, but they're they're getting away from the shape of a runner, right? And they're moving toward something that's a bit more uh, predictable in terms of hanging on the wall, like more of a square shape with lamb's tongues. Beverly says, heavy canvas drop cloth makes great painted floor rugs. It's remarkably well. And I've even, I've been lucky enough, because you know I have that Goodwill store in my town. I haven't gone for like at least a year that it's like the outlet store. And I have found in that store, not often, but painted drop cloths from like the theater. And I always used to pick them up because of, I have a theater background and it's very um, nostalgic to me to see them even when they're painted badly. But I have found those in those kinds of places and put them down on the floor in like a studio space because they're not expertly done, right? I mean, they're um, particularly for the theater, they're quickly done, right? That's, that was the story of my life for years but they still do very well for the floor. So that is an interesting rabbit hole, not unrelated at all to what we do. And in terms of pulling patterns off, if you find old uh, floor cloths, those are gonna be copyright free patterns at that point because some of them are very old, right? Um, Beverly says, latex house paint works great. Good tip. Catherine says, I painted a section of my floor leading into my bedroom and it has lasted 10 years so far. I love a painted floor. I know people who are all prim, all country, cannot cannot stand the idea of painting anything inside the house. I, I don't typically paint woodwork, but I love a painted floor because a painted floor is very old time, it's especially I think in New England. You see those painted floors in early Victorian houses and they do last and they are worn in places, but that's part of the charm is imagining the ghosts of those, of those people treading in those places or using their rocking chair in those places and they're a bit more worn. But that's part of the story of the house and the floor. And it's a part that you can see, right? I mean, it's so interesting. It's a weird kind of an x-ray of the way life has been when you look at a painted floor. I occasionally see them in old inns in the guest rooms. And you can see where people walk around the sides of the canopy bed and to the different parts of furniture to put their clothes away. There's like paths worn down a little bit in the paint. And it's just so charming. So charming. Carol says, I painted a table runner on canvas in a class just last week. It was recommended that we use polycrylic coating as a protective finish. Okay, that's good. Polycrylic coating. I haven't done this kind of craft for a long time. And there are new products all the time, too. Even at, like, Joann's and Michael's, they will have products that are specifically for, you know, I, I still tend to think about furniture and, like, old kinds of shellac and varnish. But people are moving away from some of those products because they are, number one, super toxic. Number Number two, yellow sooner rather than later. So it is well worth taking these tips here. Uh, if you're thinking about doing this kind of a project, write it down real quick because it will be helpful. I think when you rewatch these videos, I think the um, text shows up right in the video, not the thread on the sideline. So you can always peel it off later, but thanks for the great tips. So this quilt, it turns from being a runner into red bird wool quilt. And that is just another example um, of the very different styles. If you think about the pansy one we looked at first, very different projects in this book. And you have to love a book with these kinds of clear templates, right? I mean, that is extremely helpful and useful. Then you're just a whole, that whole section was templates. This part really struck me as interesting, so I used it as the thumbnail. Fruit theorem or theorem. And you know, the, this idea of doing this craft, this is actually the theorem painting. 
which this goes back to the Victorian period, early Victorian period. It's painting on velvet with stencils. And I don't mean Elvis, you know. It, it's, you know, people typically would do mostly still lifes or, or scenes outside with animals in a very Jacobian style and using a series of stencils, just like you would if you were silk screening. I took a class in theorem painting. It was my um, Christmas gift to my mom many years ago. And we went and took the class and the teacher gave us velvet and we had to we had to draw something. We drew it in advance just to make sure we weren't like deer in the headlights during a class. But, you know, we peeled off elements of the design um, and made a series of stencils with an X-Acto knife. And then we layered the stencil onto the velvet and depending on, you know, white watermelon rind or white plate, white cloud in the sky, that would all be one stencil. And then, you know, juicy, meaty part of the watermelon pink, um, another stencil. Cherries, red, maybe the red of like a leaf above another stencil. So it was a series of stencils and it was fairly um, labor intensive, but it was something that you could repeat many times, which was interesting to us because I was thinking maybe I wanted to make them and sell them. But what a fun craft. And in this book, let me see who the author is of this particular segment. Nancy Rossier, or Rossier, R-O-S-I-E-R, um, is showing us the theorem, or theorem. One of the other aspects of a theorem painting is because of the velvet, you really want to capitalize as a painter on the, the pile or the texture of the velvet um, by doing a lot of flat brush work with a lot of variety. So in other words, if you look at the background, it's more like parchment. It's not just the color. They've done a bit with one of those circular flat brushes, uh, like daub, daub, daub kind of stuff. And if you look at the gray of the tray or the table beneath, you can see they've kept away from the elements that are already in place, but they've done daub, 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 right, with like a daubing tool. And that is one of the signature things about doing a theorem. But if you're going to do a theorem and you want to do a hook drug, same pattern. Isn't that gorgeous? I mean, I have to say I love this one more because it's a hook drug. And I just love the feel of it. I love the color. It looks even more folky to me here. I just, I love this. A little bit of a color change with the leaves, not so yellow, and the cherries. So a little bit of a um, departure from the original color theme, but why not? Hooked by Sh uh, Sherry Bennett. Absolutely beautiful. A lot of directional hooking on the bottom of that, too. Right? You see how um, horizontal it is? And then in the sky, you've got more of your marble cake going on. Isn't that lovely? You know, in changing those colors, the leaves and the cherries and everything, uh, darkening them up makes it a bit more graphic, and it makes it look a bit older, doesn't it? It does really look like a painting or something that's gotten some age and some color shift. And when they do the hook drug sections of this book, they are showing you medleys or swatch sets with color families, like strawberries, watermelon, grapes, just to give you an idea of what they used. Peaches, bluebirds, really helpful. Also making me hungry, not so much the bluebirds as the peaches. And then they move on to the fall chapter, which is such a charming project. This one's called Pumpkins in the Round. And they're doing, they're showing us two rugs, uh, one on the ground and one on a chair. And it's a bit of a, um, I was going to say penny rug, but what I meant was braided rug. Because you know when people do braiding rugs, they often take one braid, make it into a small circle, and then the, the sort of configuration or the design of the rug, instead of being like one big oval or one big circle, is a s series of little circles. And yes, there's a little gap between them, but when the gap is small, um, you're not going to, you're probably not going to get your foot cut in it, uh, caught in it because it's that small. When the gap is big, you typically see them put a teeny tiny little curl in the middle, right, to fill. But I think it's a great kind of takeoff on that kind of circular braided rug that's made of many segments. So they're showing us this by Jenny Rupp, that's another name that we know, and Lisa Yego, those are two names that we know. Uh, showing this fantastic design that really does look like a play on a braided rug. And I absolutely love it. I love it so much more than if all of the faces were pumpkins. It's, it has a bit of that Brady Bunch look at the beginning where they're um, aware of each other, at least the one that's looking up. Um, but I like how the use of candy corn color and the traditional Halloween colors are well in place. Um, but a, a lot of ch a tonal changes, right? It's interesting. It's not just flat color. And it is kind of antique color, moving toward the dark brown and the dark 
black, the antique colors, um, to really pop it. What a beautiful piece. And that chapter talked about dyeing and then gives us the second example as a wool applique rug. Really pretty, right? I was really surprised um, looking at this rug. I was surprised that for, for uh, a subject that could have been easily very scattered and, and not cohesive, it is very cohesive. And it's a real gift showing you the same pattern being done in more than one medium, two or three. Because it it's very helpful, number one. It's more interesting, number two. And number three, I can't think of another book in the history of our reading that does this, where it shows you more than one medium for the same pattern. I think it's extremely helpful. Uh, Christmas star moving into winter. And let me see if they've given us, they've given us a beautiful quilt for that and a beautiful table runner, some pillows. I don't know if they've given us a some ornaments and a cross stitch. So this one's a bit different. I don't think they're giving us a rug for the last chapter, but they're showing us a quilt design and how that transfers to cross stitch, right? So interesting. And then the directions for the cross stitch. And then at the back, they're showing you how to hook, base, just basic instructions for people who have no familiarity and no past with any of these mediums. Um, but what a great book. And what a great reminder that you don't have to choose. You can enjoy, like Beverly, you can enjoy all kinds of different crafts. They all cross over in terms of not just inspiration, but patterns. The patterns are always going to cross over. If you like something you see in cross-stitch, guess what? It's a rug hooking pattern too. You just use it for rug hooking instead. So this book is a great reminder. Again, this is called Projects for Fiber Art Lovers. Just a one-off. It's not a huge book, but that's a lot of projects in one book. It's over 100 pages loaded with instructions. Um, lots of different things. Lots of food for thought. 2006. So that's a bit of an older book. Not as old as the 1920s books we've done. But something different, right? So I hope you enjoyed that episode. I'm probably going to I'm gonna try to do three independent episodes today rather than linking them so that we can save our Hooking on the Hill book for Friday Night Cocktail Night. So I will find another book tomorrow that's interesting. Maybe even an older book. Um, that we can look at and have three like like freestanding episodes this week, and then we'll do our one long subject on Friday. So I will look forward to tomorrow seeing you again at coffee time, same time, same place, noon Eastern Standard Time here on the Ribbon Candy Hooking Channel. If you don't already belong to our Facebook group and you are on Facebook, make sure that you join Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club. We hit 7,000 members this weekend. It was last night, I think. Um, I was letting people in and Kirsten lets a lot of people in too. We keep a lot of people out who are just going to do bad things. You know what I mean? Um, but I let somebody in and I saw the thing like tick over to 7,000 and I thought we have come a long way. And again, every time I pick up my phone and look at this group, I see people saying, you should do it. Keep going. It looks great. Or someone says, I need help. I can't figure out what I'm doing in this. I, you know, the, the thing came up 15 minutes ago and 30 people have already answered. And I think, what a great group. What a what good karma, right? What what a thing it is to be helpful and forthcoming with information. It's the right thing to do. So have a great day, everybody. 7,000 is a lot. It's exciting. We're the biggest group in this country now. That's, that's exciting. Um, and I have very little to do with it. It's all you, right? I've, I've been so busy lately. Uh, but I will look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And in the meantime, if you have rugs that you want me to see or other projects, uh, that fall under the category of rag rug, any, any kind, make sure you send them to me because I, I am definitely trying to get pieces that are, have not been published yet from people in this group before I reach outside of the group or bring in work from other people. I want to reach within our group first so that everybody who wants to can have that great feeling of confidence, that great thrill of seeing something of yours published in a, in a very visible book that you'll see around the stores, you know. It's a good feeling. Everybody should get the chance to have that feeling. And you're all doing great work. I will see you tomorrow at noon Eastern Standard Time. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Take care.